lovely. Um, yes, thank you. So yeah, this is all about the way I use my early years environments. It's a lot of me talking about my experience over the years, um, any action research I've done, things that I have noticed, things I have found that work for me. Um, and it's a lot of reflection I've been doing recently um, and just sharing kind of the, the things that I discovered with you. Um, I would like it to have time for thinking and reflecting and for sharing good practice as well. If anybody wants to ask anything or say anything at any time, please put it in the chat box or put the hand up on, on the, um, the, the Zoom um, chat room and we will try and answer questions as I go along. If not, then at the end, there's a, a space for that anyway. So my name's Anastasia Fletcher. I've been teaching for 10 years and eight of those years have been in the early years. I did four years in Dubai before coming over here to Hong Kong. And I'm the reception year group leader in a school in Sai Kung um, here in Hong Kong. And I'm super passionate about lots of things, including phonics, teaching, and um, that's me with the class a couple of years ago and the use of my environment. And that's become more so in the last couple of years. As I said, I'm always reflecting, I'm always learning. We always are as teachers. And um, yeah, I really love the way my children use my environment. In, my, in and outside, but I'll be talking about the inside environment today. So this is just a brief run through of what we'll look at today. I don't know how long it's going to be. It depends on if people want to talk or not. Um, I don't want to just talk at you. Uh, so none of this is really groundbreaking. It's me just sharing my practice with you. It's probably nothing you haven't heard before. Um, I didn't want to just sit here and sort of talk to you about how to set up your room or anything. It's, that's very personal and you all have your own ways of doing that. It's more of a place that we can reflect and think about the environment and the purpose behind everything we do. I don't want to just talk at you, so there will be time for interaction and talking if you would like to. And I'll give examples of what I've done, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily the way, the best way, the right way. It's just me sharing those things with you that I have found. And I, like I said, I've done lots of reflecting in the process of writing this. So it's been really nice to me and I've made changes in my room, which has been really super handy during this journey. Oh, sorry, go back and have a look. So we'll look at the importance of the environment, what children do in their class and why, how our environment supports children, um, their interests, needs and scaffolding, the characteristics of effective learning, comfort and challenge, and then we'll have feedback and questions. So when I was looking at um, the importance of the environment, doing a bit of research and reading, these are just some of the descriptions and the things that I came across that I really liked. So children learn when they feel relaxed, comfortable and at home. And I really liked that because I think it's really, really true that they need to feel like they can do anything in their classroom, that they have autonomy over their space and that they really enjoy what they're doing in school. And there's lots of words in the next quote, I won't read it all. Some of my favorite ones are joy, curiosity, possibility, and satisfaction and belonging. My children really do belong in their classroom and they really know that they do, and they really know that it's their space to do what they can. And a contribution to a young learner's developing awareness of their self as a competent individual. That's what the environment is doing for the children. It's not just a place to come and um, be told what to do. Um, so in my opinion, it's a place where they really come and they're, they're developing as a young person every single day. So I wondered if anybody would like to share in the chat box, just one word or a small phrase, just to summarize their environment. Um, if, they, if you have one currently, if you're not an earlier teacher currently, then what you think an environment should be like or what you'd like yours to be like. That'd be really great if anyone would like to share. I'll have a little look. Stimulating, yeah, definitely. My, my environment is really stimulating for, for all, all children and I'll look into that why later more in the presentation. Is there anybody else? Inspiring, yeah, that's lovely. I think children need to be inspired every day. Vocabulary rich, yeah, definitely. Stress free, that's lovely. Yeah, they really feel comfortable and relaxed. They're really nice, thank you. Colorful, yeah. Which is kind of like stimulating as well, isn't it? Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, they're really nice words to summarize as well. I think, I think my environment, says all of those things to the children. Um, obviously it can't always every single day, but yeah, they're lovely words, thank you, I agree. 
just going to try and turn off the chat. There we go. So I asked myself, what does my environment say? And I thought it'd be nice for you to have a think about what your environment says. If the environment was personified and your environment could speak to the children, I thought that mine would say, I am the third teacher. So the children know that there's me and uh, my TLA, their friends, and then there's the environment. And the environment is teaching them all the time. It's not just there to have things and stuff and toys. It's there to teach always. Um, it's saying, come and play. It's inviting them. So like someone said, their, in, their environment is, is stimulating and inviting. It should be always asking them to come and play, come here and, and do what you can. And my children also know that play is learning. And you're welcome here. So they know that they can come in and feel comfortable and relaxed and they, that they belong there. Um, learning is fun. I want them to always know that play is learning and learning is play. And it's, it's always fun for them. Um, and we always make it really a highlight to them that when, the, when we say it's choosing time, it's playing time, it, that's also learning time. You can do anything. So there's endless possibilities within the classroom. I don't ever cap the learning. I don't ever tell them they can't do things, but the environment's also saying that to them. Try something new. So I want my children to be brave. I want the environment to say to them, you can do this, you can try this, it's okay. And don't be afraid. And then it's okay to get things wrong. So I think my environment says that to the children that they know that there's so many possibilities in the room. There's, no, there's nothing they can get wrong. And they can try whatever they want and in whatever way they want to learn. And um, so I wondered if you could um, just have a think about what yours says. Um, you can share if you want to, but I'm just going to tell you why these things are um, being said in my class. So I think it's the way my resources are laid out, the resources that I have. Um, there are photos of the children everywhere, uh, which are um, celebrating their learning, showing them um, learning they've done before. There are pictures of them uh, holding things that they've made. There are pictures of them just everywhere. They know they belong in that class. They know it's theirs. The layout of my class as well is saying all of these things to the children. I think it's a really um, positive layout. It, it's secure, but it's also that they can move around within the environment. Um, they, they have their interest in the room, things that they like. I know them, I, I know what they like, I know what makes them learn. So we have things that they want to learn about in the class. It makes them excited to be there. Uh, I think about their needs, things that they need to move forward in their learning. And those things are in the class, helping them to, to progress in their learning. And they have ownership of the class. So things they've made, things that they have done in the role play, things that they've written, things that they just added to the room. So it's not my room, it's all of us. And they know that, they know it belongs to them. So if anyone wanted to share anything right now, I'm just gonna, just going to wait a few seconds for either typing or if anyone wants to say anything about their room or ask anything at this point. If not, that's absolutely fine, I'll move on. No, at the moment. No, nope. okay. So here are just a few pictures of, of my, my examples of children in my room. Um, some of those things I've just said on the previous slide. So children just really expanding their own learning, children knowing that they are welcome, children not being afraid to push themselves, um, and just some of the resources I have just to stimulate and to tell children to come and play and whatever you, you can learn is, is going to be amazing. Then I asked myself about this choosing time. We call it choosing time. We call it busy learning. Um, we call it all sorts of things, but essentially it is play time, but it's the learning time in the class. They're free choice time. And that's a huge part of the day in my class and in most early years classrooms. And um, so if the environment is so crucial, then what should choosing time look like? And this is what I was asking my, myself. So in my early days of teaching, I used to put out activities on all the tables the children would go and do those activities and then that's that's all they kind of did but I found myself over the years stripping back these activities and letting the children choose what they want to put on tables instead from the classroom resources but it's not an overloaded amount of resources there are still a set amount of resources in the classroom that they understand and learn how to use so my class this year came to me after a long time at home obviously during COVID they hadn't been in a classroom for a year, like many children around the world. 
and they've been used to being at home and sort of just being some some of them were overstimulated some were understimulated they've forgotten how to play so they they really needed the security of set activities they just didn't know how to choose anymore they didn't know how to play with things so they really needed me to almost show them what to do and give them ideas of what to do and they were stuck in nursery play they were still quite quite young the reception now but they were stuck in that nursery kind of age and did a lot of transporting just putting things around the room hiding things they weren't sure what to do so they just made a mess and um when i started giving them ideas they started to really flourish in their learning more so now there's a kind of really good balance in our classroom where i do give them ideas and i put up photos to show them how they could use things put out resources for them sometimes but let them come up with the ideas and re replenish and change these resources throughout the week or, or bi-weekly. Sometimes it's done, it's done through play, observations, sort of listening to them, the kind of things they need. Or sometimes just watching them and seeing what things they play with. I might, I might take things away, put some different things in. But I've just really found that there's this lovely mix of giving them things, but also letting them choose. It's just become a nice balance for them with my class. And um, over the years with most of my classes, I think that's worked the best. So again, this is just my opinion. This is just things that I've discovered. So again, this is just a few photos of things. So that really open-ended activities. So obviously the snowflakes and the number, uh, the pneumocon and the number lines. I'm not telling them to go and match things. I'm not telling them to do adding, but because we learned those things recently and we, we always talk about pneumocon and we've been talking about adding a lot, they want to go and use these things to do those um, activities but I haven't put out worksheets. I'm not telling them to go and do anything. They are just using that openly. And then I also have phonics there as well because there's phonics all around my room. And then there's this, the other snowflakes. So again, it's just um, kind of little transparent gems. They can, they can make patterns on there. This is a kind of investigation area. So there's all kind of open activities. I'm not telling them anything, but they know how to use these set resources. And it's just worked really well with, with my class this year. So thinking about scaffolding the learning versus giving them total free choice, kind of linked to the last slide. I found that the children use the environment to the fullest when they have really free choice about how to learn and how to play with some ideas and scaffolding from an adult as well. So showing them how to do something. Um, for example, my girls are obsessed with making paper crowns. They do this daily a lot. Um, it's got to a point where I sort of thought, I'm not going to do this for you anymore. So I started nominating a child who was really good to become an expert and they have to show their friends how to do it. And then I want them to be making that better. So putting up things in the environment for them to make that in a better way, the little gems that they love putting on, photos of crowns, things that they can be stimulated by, but not me not doing it for them and them not making the same thing over and over and over again, because that's not progression. And now they're experts in making amazing crowns with gems on, with shapes on, with all sorts of different things because they know it's in the environment, it's there, they know how to use it, they're comfortable in the environment, all the things we just talked about before. And there are times when I do scaffold or give them ideas such as the patterns on the floor on the left side of this photo. Um, we have been doing about patterns that week, but I didn't tell them what to do, I did put out different um, counters and draw, draw patterns on the floor for them to then put them on themselves. But then I, they decided they wanted to draw shapes. They got pens out and were drawing shapes on that paper. And I just discovered then they just loved big paper on the floor and just doing their own drawings. And then they used those resources around to enhance their own learning. So then that was on the floor the next week. Um, and then the girl on the right, she's just completely doing her own free choice learning We've had these resources in the classroom for a little while and they've just been challenging themselves to make different shape sizes, lengths, buildings. Um, and as I've not told them anything to do with these buildings, it's all just things in the environment, again, that's supporting their own learning. Um, this is just a little example of something my little girls did completely by themselves. Uh, a way that they use their own environment without any any support or stimulation from an, from an adult. So one one girl said to me, "Can I draw a seashell?" And 
I said, I'm not drawing it for you because I know what you want me to do because she likes me to do things for her. So what do, what can we do next? Kind of coaching her. What can we do about that? She said, I can have a picture. So then I gave her a picture of a shell. Then all of her friends obviously wanted to join. Uh, so I went and got them all different, um, uh, all a piece of card and gave them the picture. I did draw a faint outline of the size of the shell for them all because I knew they'd do something tiny otherwise. Then they, they do it, did it all by themselves and they all had these different outcomes completely on their own independent learning from the environment. I did none of this for them. Um, so they used all of their experience of their art lessons. They used things from the environment and they, it was a totally free choice with a bit of encouragement, but because of all the things I've discussed so far, they just knew that they, they knew they could use their classroom the way they wanted. They had confidence <laughs> um, and Yes, we were helping them with questions like, how can you make that better? What can you do now? But we didn't have any help at all. And I just thought these are so beautiful. They just turned out so amazingly. I was really impressed by them. I just, yeah, I'm just really proud of them. So that's just an example of how well they use the environment and how comfortable they are in their classroom and how they progress with their own learning, which is just, just so lovely to see. So then I thought about children's interests. So if I walked into your classroom, this week, what would your, I know that your children were interested in and how would I know? Um, again, you haven't got the feedback or anything, it's just something for you to think about. So we have a theme each week that we focus on. So for example, we're looking at seasons at the moment and this week is winter, last week was autumn. But it doesn't mean that my classroom is head to toe in autumn or winter, we have got things around the room. Um, but for example, like my children love dinosaurs, mainly, mainly the boys, but the girls too. So I wanted to give them something productive to do with the dinosaurs rather than the fighting, which happens a lot. Um, so I backed a small table in paper and put their favorite dinosaurs on with a book and pens. And then they were drawing environments for the dinosaurs. So the food and the trees and the cave and things that they can do. Um, and that's just from me watching them and observing and seeing how they're using their environment I know they love the dinosaurs and a lot of the time dinosaurs just end up on the carpet. So I'm giving them something productive to do with it. And then the boys wanted to go and mark make and wanted to go and write a little bit, which is lovely to see because I'm sure it's nothing new to anybody that the boys don't often want to do that. But they love this. They love just paper on a table and then they, they start mark making and writing without really realizing it. So it's lovely. And I also, my children love science experiments. So my sink area is just always full of messy playthings um, and they wanted to make some slime. So with an adult supervision, they made, we put baking soda and vinegar together and they chose the color and we spent a whole day just making these things on the side. Um, and it, it's obvious in my classroom that they're, they're scientists and they love just seeing how things work. So I made a messy area for them so they could experiment with all these different things and they just love it. They just love seeing how things work and questioning those things around them. Would anyone like to feedback at this time? I did put feedback on a question mark. Where does ask me questions? Nope, okie dog. So comfort and challenge. Um, so the children, it, uh, I asked myself about what the children can already do and what they need to progress. <clears throat> so. For example, this little boy, this is the same boy in both pictures, he spends a lot of time building, loves building. And it's fantastic and we encourage him to progress by asking him questions, by adding different resources for him, by asking him to tell a story about it, put new characters in. But then he, he used to stick, when he did do um, junk modelling, he would just stick one thing on a plate and take that home. I'm sure you've all seen that before. <laughs> put it on a plate and take it home. And it's becoming a bit of a habit. So we supported him in the environment to get out of his comfort zone. So he told us that he liked robots and that he was making robots, but really it was just a plate with a stick on it or something. It didn't look like a robot. So we put up different pictures of robots for him and gave him and put some new materials out that he doesn't usually interact with, like the ribbons and the things you can see on there, sticks and the hole punch. And these are always in the environment. So he's seen them before, just sort of encouraged him to use these different things, but with looking at pictures of robots and asked him if he wanted to make his own, but looking more closely at the photos, 
So we left him to explore these materials and decide what he wanted to do with them. And he made this lovely robot out of the paper plate, but with lots of different materials on and slightly less tape. He likes tape, but this is less tape than normal. So we actually thought about it and he actually came up with something that looks more like a robot than he used to make. And so it just showed me that the children can thrive with, with comfort, but also with challenge. Um, because this little boy experienced the flow state where he, he'd never thought of learning something before. So he's really in a state with enjoyable and challenging an interesting experience and he sort of had a peak level of engagement that he might not have ever done he might have just done buildings all day long for the rest of the year and now he really enjoys doing junk modeling and he always makes something with more detail and something that looks like um, the thing that he's building which is just lovely so the environment really helps him with stimulating photos and those familiar resources that he knew he could use so thinking more about resources as well <clears throat> I just thought of some words that um, I'd like to summarize my resources and how resources would, would uh, are useful to be in an early years environment. So really accessible. Um, again, I don't have lots of things in my room. My room doesn't isn't a storage room for resources. I only have the things in that children can use at any time. But we we encourage them. Well, we teach them how to use the resources. Of course, they can't just get everything out, which they try to do a lot. But the resources are very accessible. They can reach everything, they can get everything. They know how to use it all. Resources are stimulating. So we change them not too much because they, it's nice to have that comfort and familiarity, but we do change resources, put in those things that they're interested in, um, things that they haven't seen before, things that are shiny, <laughs> things that are sparkly, things that they will just want to go and use and really inviting. Things that are challenging and thought provoking. So. It doesn't have to be um, something that they know how to use, something that's obvious to use, something that they can figure out. For example, the little girls in the loose parts area, really open-ended. They This is a fire with some marshmallows on. And obviously none of that is real marshmallows or anything. It's all imagination. It's all completely them using something that's open-ended. It can go in any direction that they want it to go in. I, no one's told them what to do. Um, but then the little girl on the left, again, using the Numicon and the numbers, she did start lining the, up the Numicon with the numbers and matching them, but it was totally her choice. It was just her using her knowledge of numbers and her knowledge of the environment to make her own game. Okay, so a little bit of thinking time again. <clears throat> if anyone wants to feedback, chat or, or talk live, that would be great. So where in your classroom do children go the most? And why do you think that? So I'll just tell you about mine, first of all, and then if anyone would like to do any feeding back, that would be really lovely just to hear. So my children mostly go to the, um, the carpet with the building equipment. I'm sure many people it's the same. With the bamboo sticks and the blocks and the small world resources that they, they can use as well. And the mass things, they bring it all together so I wanted to really ensure that the children were learning there as fully as they can be. That children aren't just coming just to make a building, call it um, a castle, <laughs> and they're not learning anything. So I was thinking about why they're going there. What is it about this area of the room that makes them want to go there? What makes them want to learn? And how could it be the same in, in other areas of the classroom? Um, does anyone want to type anything about where children go the most in their classroom or to anyone want to speak? The book section. Nice. They love to choose their own book to read. Yeah, my children don't go there a lot. I need to think about why. <laughs> but we, I, do, I do have lots of books around the room, so maybe that's because that's why they don't go to the book area. My book area is more of a kind of place to go and relax. Anybody else? That's really interesting. I need to think about my my area, my book area. Okay, so I'll move on. If anyone wants to put anything in, that's great. So since the children love building so much, I wanted them to integrate this as much as, as integrate as much as they could into this building. So every week or two, I change one aspect of the building area, such as putting in different small world animals, creatures, people, or some plants or some different loose parts. 
<clears throat> I usually keep the building blocks the same. So it's those familiar resources. So they're familiar and comfortable with them, but challenging their imagination as well. So as you can see, this, this is all the same area, a few same children, but most, I think there's a lot of different ones too. And every building they've made is something a bit different. So they're adding in those small bits of detail. Sometimes they're trying to make it tall. Sometimes it's, it's a fairy tale castle, but they're not just doing the same thing over and over again. They are learning, they are thinking about different ways to make it nice or make it into a story. Um, oh, someone said that their water play and craft corner. Oh, craft corner, yeah, definitely. <laughs> At the beginning of the year, my children just cut stuff and stuck stuff together for about two weeks. Yeah, craft corner is always a really good one, isn't it, for children to, to go to. Yeah, so yeah, my, my um, building, not really building area, it's just my, my carpet has become a building area. But I just think every day they, do, they build something new, they're, they're challenging themselves. I mean, it's the vocabulary and the culture of the classroom too, but it's the environment that's really supporting the children to do that. So I don't know if everyone's familiar with the characteristics of effective learning, but um, it's the, the three areas are to ensure that children are playing and exploring, their active learning, and they have a chance to be creative and critical thinkers. So again, it's just a chance to think about your classroom and where these things are happening. So what opportunities are there for children to engage in the exploration and challenge? Or what supports them to keep on trying and to focus on activities for their own enjoyment? And where can they come up with their own ideas and make links? So there's a couple of pictures of here, here, here of two of my children. Um, One's using, the, again, the paper on the floor, which became a staple part of my, sort of near my investigationally mathsy equipment. Um, child, what a little girl is, she's making up her own game with the maths. It's, she's, she was doing patterns, but also it became, I think it was, became a game where she, she had to count and then there was something, yeah, that she came up with and she, she did tell me how to play it. But again, it's not, she's not just making patterns. She's not just repeating those things that we've learned. She's using it in her play. She's really exploring, having the chance to come up with her own thinking, her own critical thinking skills. And as you've just said, um, Jamie Lee, the craft corner, um, junk modeling is a firm favorite. And this little boy is having the chance to, to actively learn. It's an open-ended activity. He is thinking, about how to make something, how to make it look like a, an object that he knows. He's really exploring the, the, the materials. No one's telling him what to do, but he, he does have pictures of um, some things to, to stimulate his thoughts. He might be talking to an adult as well about what he's doing. So yeah, just the culture in my classroom does have a lot of characteristics of effective learning, supporting the children every day, as well as different parts of the, the curriculum, like the, lit the literacy and the maths. So again, this is just some examples of children um, using resources for challenging, giving them a chance to explore their own skills and learning. And they're mostly open-ended so they can learn actively and take it in their own direction. So yes, there are those closed-ended activities sometimes but we very rarely use a worksheet. We very rarely have a book. Um, everything we do is recorded on um, Tapestry, which is the online platform. So everything is photos, everything is discussion. It's a lot of verbal learning and play. So it's mostly open-ended activities um, set out in a way that supports the children to engage in their own learning and further their own learning. Uh, and we do, we do change those things weekly for the enhancements, but everything will stay the same usually throughout the year or throughout at least a term for that comfort and that so children really, really understand their own environments. So over my time, I've also found that very few children will go to a maths table or, or a writing table, especially if you call it the maths table. They don't really want to go there. There will be the odd children, there'll be a few. There are always those children that are mathematicians and they want to go to the maths table. But I've just found that children engage in maths a lot more if it's just available around the room. So for example, there are numbers and shapes in the role play. There's measuring in the building area. There are weighing scales in the messy area. 
And children are just engaging in maths then without knowing it. Um, same for writing. So the writing table can be a quite forced and quite pressurized. But we have found that uh, putting writing in different areas around the classroom for children to interact with, for children to engage with by themselves. Children do that more with less pressure. So again, it's, uh, I don't want to um, stereotype, but the, the boys mainly that don't always want to start writing as soon as girls, having that writing in the building area, drawing their building, writing about it, mark making about it, writing about um, my book, my boys this week wanted a book about cars in the car area or in the, the building area. They just wanted to, can you make me a book about cars? And then they start drawing cars and mark making about them. So it's not a writing area, it's just around the room. So yeah, I just find that the pressure is really reduced if all these things are just available within the play, within the resources. So I wanted to, just to give you a minute to think about where you could include more maths and more writing or reading in, in every area of your class. Maybe your maths table or your literacy table work really well for you, but perhaps there are other places that could be included around the room just to make it a bit more accessible. So here are just a few photos of my children around the room. <coughs> a little girl there doing some measuring in, in, um, in this messy corner. So they're making potions, this was a little while ago, but they're just using um, weighing scales, they're using measuring jugs, and they start talking about the numbers on the jugs. They want to measure their potion to see how much they've got. There are children with the loose parts making patterns. I haven't told them to make patterns, but it's something that came, came from the resources when they were playing. And then in the, in the building area, there are patterns for children to make in their buildings. There are numbers everywhere. There's writing everywhere, there's writing opportunities. There's writing in the messy play that links to whatever the messy play was that week. This was about, this was just some uh, ducks in water. And then there's a right, there, there is a, a writing table this week because we, we're doing about Frozen this week. <laughs> um, been very popular, obviously. A little Frozen book and a book about winter to go on that table as well. Books about winter around the classroom. So they're just having the opportunities to find these things throughout the, everything they're playing. They, they're kind of doing it by accident. It's not a pressurized thing. They're just, in, within their play, they're always finding books, writing and, and reading of, um, and math opportunities. Oh, and that's, the, that's just the last slide, I think. <laughs> One of them. So a really important part of my environment um, is, is, are my displays and pictures of the children. So we, in our school, we don't have a huge display policy. Our policy is basically celebrate the children and make sure they know that they're amazing. What they've done is worthy of, of being put on display, that they, they, what they've learned is incredible, that they've, they've, they've kind of celebrated and something they've achieved. So we do lots of working walls. I change my displays quite a lot because we want them to see what they've done that week or the, a few weeks before. And they can see lots of pictures of themselves, which obviously they love. They spend lots of time looking for themselves. They, they remember what they've done then. They can think about what they learned before. And it's easy for them to see. Some of them are interactive. They have quotes, fo and again, photos of them. And they're just a massive celebration of what the children have done because they do work just so hard. They, they just, within our environments, they're just, progressing just massively. So yeah, they just a huge uh, celebration of everything they've done. And my phonics and maths walls are always working walls. So they're changeable and showing their a progression. But sometimes we have other things as well. And yeah, I just think they're a really important part of my environment. And that's it. It's gone super quick. Um, so did anyone want to ask anything or say anything at this point? Um, I know that uh, I've pitched that uh, maybe people I know are experienced and people might not be experienced or they might be at different levels. I don't know if people, where people are coming from in their level of their journey in the early years at the moment. So if anyone wanted to ask anything or say anything to support others, that would be really great. I'm just going to give a few seconds for people to 
either put in the chat or just speak. Hi, I have a question. Hi, yes. So one of the schools that I work with, they have um, like an English club which runs for 15 minutes every day. Yeah. I think that would be quite a good time to introduce some of the things that you suggested, kind of like having the resources around. Yeah. Um, so obviously with 15 minutes, it's quite limited what you can like put out or what you can do. So what kind of like key resources or um, activities would you suggest starting with? So as an English club, what's the kind of objective of the club? Is it a speaking a club? Yeah. Is it just chance for them to gain new vocabulary? Yeah, just a chance for them to practice using English informally to chat with the teachers and with their friends in English. Yeah, and it's reception children? Um, yeah, P1, P2. So the youngest, yeah. So I just find that my, my EAL children, the children that are, are acquiring English, the, the things that they play with the most are those things that are really familiar to them. So I don't know where you are, sorry, but maybe what country you're in around the world. Oh, Things that are familiar to their home environments would be really nice, stimulating for them. Um, and then, what else do my children play with a lot? Those things that are sort of traditional tales or things that are relating to modern stuff like the, the frozen things and the cars and all that sort of, <laughs> the things that they just... Um, see and hear a lot in their environments um so to get them speaking that's that's my experience of what they talk about the most so home um and then like pop culture and then those sort of traditional stories things they can start repeating and the words they can start learning from them and then playing with those things in the play so i think when i had the ducks that was because we we're doing about the little ugly duckling so then they just be linking those resources to stories and things they can then use in their play that are really familiar and in our role play they really loved having just things from their homes real things real real um real sorry real life objects i couldn't say that then that they really know and can pretend to use and talk about so in terms of in terms of learning new vocabulary i think those things have really helped my eal children the most um yeah that makes sense <laughs> familiar stuff that will spark conversation Thank you so much. <laughs> After the children finished their works, how did you give them feedback from Zoe? So our feedback in play with our children is it's ongoing assessment for learning. So our feedback is constant. So it will be during the play with them. It will be, again, those EAL children, like um, the question that was just asked before about learning new vocabulary. If it's within the play, we'll be, we'll be helping them to learn new words during their play. We'll be repeating those words with them, giving them chances to learn them, to talk about those new experiences with their friends. So the feedback is constant. It's not, um, it's not something we do as, an, as a summative thing. It's, it's, it's a formative, it's as we go. But in a nice way that we do feedback is that they talk about what they've done that day with um at the end of the day so children will come and show things they've made during the day children will come and tell their friends how their brain has grown so we talk about our brain growing a lot i always say but now that it's choosing time now that it's busy learning how is your brain going to grow and they know now that they can't then just run around with a dinosaur <laughs> banging it on their friend because we'll say to them how is your brain growing doing that and they'll be like mm, okay so then they actually feed back to each other and they feed back as peers a lot so they talk about what they've done how it's how they've grown their brain how they've improved that day how they've progressed their learning why it wasn't the same as yesterday and then we will support that and give them the vocabulary for that but we don't give them feedback after each thing they've done it will be through carpet sessions it will be through questioning it will be through our, our assessment constant assessment and then how we then move them forward with that so yeah, it's not something that's at the end of when they finish their work. It's something that's really ongoing through every every interaction we have with the children. Thank you, Zoe. That's a really good question. Does anybody else like to ask anything or say anything? No? Okay. Yeah, Anastasia, uh, I would like to ask a question. Yeah. 
like um, so for the for the children, um, I can see that the uh, the picture and there's a picture called um, it's called a uh, messy corner. So, uh, what kind of activities you will do, uh, yeah, with the children uh, with this corner? Which one was that? Um, I saw one. Yeah, there is. Let me. Messy corner is maybe towards the end, almost oh. towards the end. Okay, if you have a look, I'll try and get that picture back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I also check it yeah. <laughs> now. Yeah. So what will what will you do? Um, yeah, in that uh, messy corner. So messy is it here? I think this one maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> So the messy, the messy play area is actually a really good question because one of our parents asked about that this week and we, we sent a, an answer in, in the email because parents ask about the messy, court, messy play a lot. And I, and I understand why it's um, a questionable area of, of learning. So my answer is that messy play um, is sort of an early start of scientific thinking. It's a chance for them to... to um, look at the way different materials act together. It's a way of looking at how they can change materials and they can think about textures, the way things feel. They can look at how things um, move, how different resources interact with um, other equipment resources of, with themselves. Um, so mess, the messy tray we change weekly. Sometimes we change it every few days. So this week we've got there's a, um, a thing called like fake snow where you, you put it with water it's dry you put it with water and it turns into this lovely snowy stuff we'll be doing about um winter at the moment and we made it blue and sparkly and glittery and the children this week are looking at that and so they're they're doing things like measuring with that they've got little um things that they pick it up with and put it into bottles they're measuring with it they're seeing how heavy it is they're thinking about how it got made they're thinking about when you put water in, why is it turning into this? So the messy play area is for them to really think about just, just the way the things feel, the learning new vocabulary. It's a way that they can learn the words like slimy or um, the wor uh, words like, oh, I can't think of any more messy play words. <laughs> There's lots and lots of words. They can play with ice. Sometimes we give them just things frozen in ice. They have to try and get the creatures out of the ice or um, corn flour and water and looking at the way that moves it's, it's a really really great texture corn flour and we would just make things really bright really inviting and it's just a place they can just learn so much together so messy play is exactly what it says messy play um, and it's a, just a place for them to really think and talk together and try new things, try new resources, try new materials, um, and just get messy. And then <laughs> just, yeah, it's just a great area of the classroom. Yeah, thank you.